Hey guys, this is the Roman. Mr. Regular is off for the week, so I'm filling in with another car, bleh, bleh, RCR car stories. I probably should have just done that takeover, but whatever. Uh, the video about the Dale kind of did surprisingly well, all things considered, so I kind of just decided to do another one. Now, this video is about the history behind Yedsel, one of the most notorious failures in automotive history. And while it's in no way comprehensive and it's intended more as a primer to this entire mess, um, I would definitely recommend reading up on the Edsel if this story interests you in any way whatsoever. Because it's really a fascinating story once you get down to the brass tacks of it. Either way, I really do hope you enjoy this as much as I enjoyed making it. Edsel. Five letters that have become a synonym for automotive disaster. It was seen as a potential moneymaker in its own time, but circumstances essentially doomed the Edsel to become the automotive heaven's gate. The movie, not the cult, although you could argue the Edsel's end was similarly disastrous. By 1960, it was kind of a miracle that Ford executives could even sit down with all the butthurt surrounding this car's failure. You could make the case that the Edsel might have been able to turn things around, provided it was given more time and, you know, a bit more care and attention to detail, although I'm not really sure it's an argument anyone would choose to make. The writing was on the wall just a little over a year into its production. By late 1959, the company had to essentially put the kibosh on the Edsel in a move that's sort of like cutting off a zombie-bitten arm to keep the rest of your body from turning. You see, the Edsel was a wall-to-wall, five-alarm dumpster fire of a marketing blitz. It wasn't even that the car itself was bad. There have been worse cars before and since, and there may be worse yet. Hell, the Edsel came out the same year as the 58 Zundap Janus, a German car so ugly you could use a picture of it to figure out when you've had too much to drink. Because if this starts to look attractive to you, it's time to hand your keys to a friend. But it all comes back to the central question. Why is the Edsel considered the failure of all automotive failures? How did the Edsel become a cautionary tale for automotive manufacturers worldwide, and an abject lesson in how corporate hubris can spread as easily as an Appalachian trail of acne on an oily teenage face? Well, let's dig into it, shall we? This is a brief history of the Edsel. It all started way the hell back in 1945. Henry Ford was forced into retirement and was succeeded by Henry Ford II. Now, in a crazy move, Henry II hired a flock of pencil pushers with degrees in business administration, and they were eventually known as the Whiz Kids. They were a collection of guys with hard-lined faces, like they were constantly thinking, this, this would be the day they were finally going to talk to that cute barista. The group included such luminaries as future Ford CFO J. Edward Lundy, finance man R.J. Miller, and Robert McNamara, the future Secretary of Defense under Presidents Kennedy and Johnson, and the man who holds the distinction of being the longest-serving Secretary of Defense in American history, having served for seven years. He would also go on to serve as President of the World Bank from 1968 to 1981, just to give you some idea of the kind of talent Henry Ford II was roping into this thing. But there was a pretty big catch. For all their degrees in finance and business, the ten men, for the most part, had a complete lack of any experience in the automobile industry whatsoever. To some, this was a good thing since it offered a fresh vision for the company in the post-war years. To others, it was a signal of the changing of the guard, of a less democratic corporation, and more of a business run on cronyism and collective narcissism. Either way, the effect of hiring these whiz kids was that a new corporate structure was created for Ford, which eventually led to the automaker becoming a publicly traded company. This had the end result of elevating two of those whiz kids to the presidency of Ford. McNamara became the first non-Ford family member to be president of the company when he was selected in 1960, and R.J. Miller would eventually follow him later that decade. The initial belief was that Henry Ford II was simply surrounding himself with buddies, and... That isn't entirely off the mark, considering the Whiz Kids included noted Ford friends like Lundy and Tex Thornton, the man who founded Litton Industries, which would go on to employ Dale Clift, 
the inventor of the Dale, in an interesting little throwback to the first one of these new RCR stories. But the fact of the matter was that the rejuvenated corporate restructuring helped boost sales to put Ford back on the level of GM in the early 1950s. Granted, it was below what the company was hoping to achieve, but it was still an improvement over where they had been in those early post-war years. So Ford took things to the next level by creating four new special divisions. The Lincoln, Mercury, and Continental divisions would focus on luxury vehicles, while the Special Products division would focus on discovering the next great car to launch the Ford brand to the top of the auto heap. This theoretical car, known only as the E-car for experimental, would be breathed to life with an aggressive strategy Ford had only just started using, called motivational research. It's what we would come to know today as market research. While market research is as common today as time-lapse cooking videos on Facebook, it was a fairly novel approach back in the 1950s, since it allowed corporations to more closely engage with the people they were aiming to please. Well, at least in theory. The goal of this approach was not just to figure out the things consumers wanted, even if they might not know they want them, but to figure out how to talk them into wanting something they might not otherwise consider. It's a principle that followed off of Henry Ford's famous quote that if he had asked people what they wanted back in his heyday, they would have said a faster horse. Of course, the quote is an apocryphal bit of fluff that Ford might not actually have ever said, but it's often attributed to him anyway, and it follows from the same notion. Consumers are flimsy and generally have no idea what they want, so it's up to the benevolent corporation to figure it out for them. Ford brought in a man named David Wallace as manager of market research for the special products division. Now, he didn't have any more experience in the automotive industry than any of the whiz kids did when they joined Ford, but Wallace had a background as market researcher for Time Magazine, and much like the whiz kids before him, Wallace could provide a fresh perspective since he was an automotive industry outsider. So it was up to Wallace to not only lead the market research efforts, he was also tasked with coming up with a name for the e-car. Now, naturally, you'd think coming up with a cool name for a new car would be easier than picking through hundreds, if not thousands, of potential consumers and figuring out what in the blue, blessed hell they wanted out of a car. But, yeah, you'd be mistaken. Strangely enough, one of the earliest names considered for the car actually was Edsel, after Henry Ford II's father, who, incidentally enough, was one of the most popular guys in company history. The people who worked with him and who knew him wanted to honor him by naming the car after him, but Henry Ford II hated the name, so it was back to the drawing board to come up with a better name, any name, that wasn't Edsel. Before setting out to choose a name for the e-car, Wallace laid down a few ground rules. For one, it had to be short, with two syllables, three at most. It also needed to be something relatively straightforward, but also distinct. It should begin with the letter C, S, or J, or other letters that could easily be prettied up with ornamental typeface, and it should definitely avoid bulkier letters like K, M, or W. In addition, it shouldn't be anything that could be twisted into a double entendre, and it also shouldn't translate into anything obscene in a foreign language. What followed was something akin to an internal sweepstakes around Ford, as executives basically listened to anyone with an idea, reviewing new names virtually every day on a projector inside a small room with no windows. It's like Lay's Do Us a Flavor competition, except instead of potato chip flavors, people were trying to name a car that could end up being the flagship vehicle of the entire company. So yeah, no pressure. After an initial period of suggestions, the frontrunners eventually came down to Citation, Corsair, Pacer, and Ranger. But other names tossed around included the Arrow, the Phoenix, and the Altair. Altair? I, I don't know. Assassin's Creed makes me wonder how to pronounce it. Another name being considered was the Simplex, which was suggested by Louis Crusoe, the man who named the Thunderbird. He had a similar gut feeling about the name Simplex, and it led Wallace to worry that Crusoe's pull as Vice President of Vehicle Operations would make the name not just a possibility, but an inevitability. Considering he hated the name Simplex, Wallace was understandably mortified. So Ford outsourced some of the planning to advertising agency Foot, Cone, and Belding, in the hopes that a better name would present itself, and common sense would prevail. So FCNB got to work. 
In order to inspire creativity among its workers, FC&B decided to have an internal sweepstakes of its own with the help of Ford. Everyone in the company was allowed to pick a name, and if the name was chosen, they would receive a complimentary e-car. Now, I'm sure employees would have rather just had the car's value for a prize rather than some hypothetical car that might take years to roll off the factory line, but it didn't really have a negative impact on the quality of submissions. Why? Because FCNB employees somehow came up with the exact same names. Well over 6,000 names were submitted, and those were narrowed down to just 10 by FCNB, and, in a shock to Ford, the shortlist included the original four frontrunners, Citation, Corsair, Pacer, and Ranger. According to Wallace, the probability of this happening was 1 in 3.5 million. So it had to be one of those names, right? Well, you'd think so, but... You have to remember, we're dealing with perhaps the most notoriously headstrong collection of brain trusts in the history of American automotives. Like the food fight scene in the movie Hook, everything was on the table, and nothing was on the table. Stuck at an impasse, Wallace came up with a crazy idea. To reach out to a poet that the wife of his assistant happened to like, just to see what she could come up with. So he wrote a letter to the poet, Pulitzer Prize winner Marianne Moore asking if she could come up with a name. Interestingly, not only did she agree to help, she offered to do it pro bono. Because he didn't expect a reply when he solicited her help, Wallace didn't bother giving more any of the guidelines he'd given to his own team, meaning he received all sorts of crazy-ass names. There's the Hurricane Aquila, which is Latin for eagle, the Hurricane Accipiter, which is another bird of prey, Erundo, a genus of plants in the grass family, and the Ford Silver Sword, which at least rhymed, even if it conjured violent imagery. And those were the tame ones. Before long, Wallace was inundated with a series of increasingly ridiculous names, including the Tonnerre Alifaire, or Winged Thunder, the Regna Racer, the Anticipator, the Mongoose Civique, the Ford Fabergé, which is a huge boost of confidence for its durability. The Dearborn Diamante, the Pastelogram, the Thundercrester, and the Arc en Ciel, which stands for Rainbow. And more didn't stop there, no. See, the next week, she mailed Wallace a fresh new list of names like the Thunderbird Alley, the Turbo Torque, the Crestalark, the Triskelion, the Pluma Piluma, the Adante con Moto. The Taper Racer, Taper Acer, the Regina, Regina? Either way, it was nicknamed the Rex. And the Tiralok, which means bullseye. And the Chaparral, which Google tells me is vegetation consisting chiefly of tangled shrubs and thorny bushes. So yeah, great name for a car. It kind of started to sound like Pokemon names at the end of a Pokemon Honest Trailers video. She even added a PS to the list about how she was disobeying her brother's advice and suggesting an additional name, the Turcotinga, which is a portmanteau of the words turquoise and Katinga, the latter being a solid indigo South American finch or sparrow, because I guess she was obsessed with bird names. Names? She would later suggest one final name, the Utopian Turtle Top, a suggestion which more or less confirmed Wallace's suspicion that he should probably avoid actually running any of these names past corporate, for fear of being laughed out of the building. But hey, he seemed to get a kick out of the suggestions, and he appreciated Moore's efforts enough to mail her some flowers around Christmas time since she wouldn't accept actual payment, although something tells me she would have been happier getting a bird in the mail. Eventually, it came to nut-cutting time, and and Ford chairman Ernest Breach sat in for Henry Ford II, who was on vacation because of course he was. And so these final naming meetings had this extra layer of stress to them because, you know, they had to come up with something that they thought Henry Ford II would like too. Breach hated all of the names that they had come up with, so the committee had no choice but to go over some previously rejected names Breach presumably hadn't heard yet, such as the Droff. No, seriously, the Droff. And if you don't know why that name is utterly ridiculous, try spelling it backwards. This is how desperate these men were. I've been to clubs at 2 a.m. as the lights came on and saw drunk, lonely men who weren't as utterly bereft of possibility as this committee. It got to the point where any reasonable name would have been accepted. And Lord knows the committee tried, even suggesting the name Benson 
after one of Henry Ford II's brothers. It wasn't until Breach rejected this name that some frustrated person in the room just threw out the name Edsel, which caused Breach to perk up and take notice. In lieu of a better name, and with just about everyone wanting to go the hell home already, it was agreed that the E-car would officially become the Edsel. Wallace himself even admitted the name was a terrible idea, as he wrote a letter to Marianne Moore, revealing that they had decided on Edsel, adding in the postscript, I know you will share your sympathies with us. And, yeah, that probably tells you everything you need to know about how poorly received the name was. But it was the only name the committee could agree on. Some popes were elected in less time it took Ford to come up with the name, and the car was treated with no less reverence. And that's because, much like Henry Ford II in comparison to Henry Ford, the Edsel was expected to be more than it was. It's probably not a hot take to say that it wouldn't have mattered what Ford had called it had the Edsel been a better car. Hell, it might have even been a modest success had Ford been better about managing expectations, because really, the Edsel wasn't that bad. For instance, despite the styling not being up to the standards of what the public wanted in the late 1950s, the Edsel did offer several features that were innovative for its time, such as a rolling dome speedometer that lit up if you exceeded your pre-programmed speed limit, and a push-button system that automatically shifted the transmission using an electric servo motor. Sure, Chrysler technically did this first with the power flight and torque flight transmissions in 1956, and in fact, you could go back even further to the Vulcan electric gear shift system in 1913, which was offered by, among other automakers, the SGV company in good old Reading, PA. But Ford was looking to make the Edsel more aesthetically pleasing by making the steering wheel more of a driver's hub, cleaning up the dashboard by eliminating the obstructive, column-mounted shifter, and generally just giving everything a sleeker, more driver-friendly appearance. Of course, traditionalists could return to the comforting reassurance of a three-speed manual transmission by adding the optional column shifter. In addition to the push-button transmission, the Edsel offered an electronically controlled hood release, self-adjusting brakes, and a triple thermostat cooling system. There were also warning lights for the parking brake, an overheating engine, and a low oil level, in addition to providing a front-mounted distributor, coil, fuel pump, and oil filter dipstick. And hey, the Edsel was ahead of its time in safety by offering actual seat belts and childproof locks at a time where parents were still having the kids make all the cocktails at dinner parties. Ah, the good old days. When you knew how to fix a highball before you knew how to ride a bike. As far as functionality, the Edsel could take you from 0 to 60 in 10.2 seconds on the standard E400 V8, which had 361 cubic inch displacement and made 303 horsepower at 4600 RPM and 400 pound-feet of torque at 2800 RPM. In a funny little fact, Ford would actually display the torque rating on the engine to make it appear more powerful since it was a bigger number. This was just another instance of functionality that couldn't live up to presentation. Internal projections had first-year sales hitting 200,000, but in reality, production for 1958 didn't exceed 63,107 units. The chickens were finally coming home to roost, and by this point, it was hard to say that many people at Ford were surprised. In fact, given the tumultuous nature of its planning and development, it would have been a Rudy-like success story had it ended any other way than how it did. I mean, this car was positively marred by one issue after another, even after cars started rolling off the factory line. Take the Teletouch system, for instance. The problem with Teletouch was that it wasn't nearly as convenient as its marketing would suggest. You get this little pod with a series of buttons in the center, and while it's not exactly difficult to push a button in the center of the steering wheel, and while the buttons remain locked in a place so that they wouldn't change position with the motion of the wheel... So many drivers were used to the car horn being there that there was an intrinsic risk of dangerous gear changes. Now granted, the risk was relatively low, considering that the Edsel had an electrohydraulic inhibitor switch to prevent just this thing from occurring at speeds above 5 miles per hour. But push-button transmissions were eventually phased out due to industry-wide safety concerns, so regardless of how well it did or didn't work, one of the Edsel's biggest features would have still been rendered obsolete. Other factors working against the Edsel included a simple fact that's felled many cars before it and countless cars since. The Edsel hit the market during a recession. 
Sales were down across the board in the automotive industry in 1958, with Mercury taking a 48% hit from the year previous, Dodge declining 47%, Buick 33%, Pontiac 28%, and Oldsmobile 18%. Basically, Ford picked one of the worst years since the Great Depression to debut a new car, especially when you factor in that the habits of the buying public had largely changed, with many going towards smaller models with an emphasis on fuel efficiency. To make it even more ridiculous, because assembly on the Edsel was run between Fords and Mercury's, assemblers would become mixed up in their routine and occasionally forget to install certain parts, and some of the parts that were installed didn't even fit properly. So dealerships were getting these unfinished cars with missing parts that were difficult to replace. Ford tried like hell to cover their ass with aggressive marketing, but if the dealerships aren't on your side, there's not a whole lot you can do. With that said, the marketing was honestly kind of brilliant. Ford funded a variety series on CBS known as The Edsel Show, a one-hour special that featured Frank Sinatra, Bing Crosby, Louis Armstrong, Rosemary Clooney, and Bob Hope. It was a murderer's row of talent. It premiered on October 13, 1957 and became one of the highest-rated shows of the year, even earning an Emmy nomination for Best Single Program of the Year, although it lost to Playhouse 90. And yet, while the Edsel itself was promoted on the show, which, again, drew monster ratings, nobody really cared about the car itself. Sure, Ford tried to tease audiences by paying for full-page ads in Life magazine, where they'd use blurry photos or Edsels hidden by car covers to entice consumers. But the enthusiasm for the car just wasn't there, and they couldn't make it appear out of nothing. I mean, if people just didn't care, they didn't care. Fortunes didn't really improve in the years ahead, either. And by years, I mean all two of them. By August 1959, Ford was reluctantly preparing the first 1960 Edsel pre-production cars. However, a little over three months later, on November 19, 1959, Ford announced it would discontinue the Edsel, with the final ad appearing in the Saturday Evening Post just two days later, as a sort of grim postscript to the car's failure. Ultimately, bad marketing only carries so far as an excuse. The real problem with the Edsel was that it wasn't a strong enough product to overcome its limp-dick, downward-spiral, all-hands-on-deck approach, because, if anything, all hands proved to be too damn many. Everyone had a say in the Edsel, from low-level employees to consumers themselves. Hell, I'm kind of surprised the failure of the car didn't cause Ford to swear off market research altogether. But then... It seems everyone took an L on this one. Marketing can't be everything, because when marketing is everything, you get No Man's Sky. You get my debut album, probably. Maybe. I, I don't know. Whatever. It's like having your mom do all your Tinder flirting for you. No matter how awesome you are, she is always, always going to write a check that you just can't cash, because you're her baby. And it's only natural she's going to talk you up like the second coming. And this was Ford's baby. Except Ford eventually decided it wasn't worth it to have the Edsel hanging around, rent-free, eating all the apple butter, and bringing in next to nothing from a seasonal job as a tour guide at Crystal Cave. As with any failure in the automotive industry, Ford had to know when to let go. And if there's any silver lining in this for Ford, it's that they managed to recognize that point sooner than most. And that's a wrap on the second RCR Stories podcast documentary. Maybe I'll just call it a pod doc or something, I don't know. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope this got you interested in learning more about the Edsel. Mr. Regular and I have been pretty busy writing the weekly regular car reviews, so I don't know how often I'm going to be able to get to do these little specials, but if people enjoy these, I'll find the time. Reviews will be back next week, and hopefully I'll see you there. Until next time, thank you so much for listening, and have a great week.